Hey guys, Canadian Range Nut here. It is Wednesday, June the 22nd, uh, 2022. A uh, few things to talk about. So first thing I want to talk about today is uh, it recently it was discovered that Trudeau <clears throat> and the RCMP commissioner uh, used the massacre of 2020 to help get their uh, anti-gun agenda going. Uh, so I've got an article I'm going to read about that and then some background with from the RCMP commissioner uh, about her stance on... Um, systemic racism and they they will connect you'll see that when i play it second thing i want to talk about is more details came out in the uvalde texas shootings uh if you haven't heard yet some very disturbing stuff third is uh the liberals in canada want to continue their hybrid parliament model for another year and then the fourth thing i wanted to post was a pretty inspiring speech about freedom from tamara leach or lich i can't remember how to pronounce her name um so those are the four things i'm talking about so a bit of a shorter podcast today so first thing i want to get to is uh literally this just came out it's an article from the toronto sun and they were discussing this in the house of commons um the title of the article trudeau interfered with rcmp in nova scotia shooting says report now if you don't remember there was a uh, mass shooting in canada in nova scotia back in 2020 um where many uh civilians were killed the guy just went on a rampage with a bunch of guns uh, he i believe he had a um, couple semi-automatic handguns and then a couple semi-automatic uh, rifles as well so here we go with that article uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau used the mass shooting in Nova Scotia to advance his political goals and interfered in an active police investigation to do it. That's the evidence presented at the inquiry into the April 2020 shooting that took the lives of 22 people. The evidence, including interviews with senior RCMP officers and officials, including handwritten notes, are enough to call for Trudeau and RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky to resign. The report released Tuesday by the public inquiry into the mass shooting that took place in Nova Scotia on April 18th and 19th, 2020, paints a grim picture. It shows a national police force that is in disarray and clearly prone to political interference, something that should never happen. The report includes testimony from Superintendent Darren Campbell, who was the public face of the RCMP in Nova Scotia, and Leah Scanlon, Director of Communications for the Mounties in the region. They both described a meeting they were summoned to on April 28th, one week after the shooting. RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky was upset that those leading the investigation in Nova Scotia had not released the kinds of firearms used by the killer, something investigators said would compromise their work. Quote, the commissioner said she had promised the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister's office that the RCMP, we, would release this information, read the handwritten notes Campbell took at the time. Uh, that is a huge thing. That's basically saying that the head of the RCMP was working with the government to help implement a gun agenda. And why would they want um, the public to know what kind of firearms were being used? Because obviously they want to push that anti-gun agenda, which they actually ended up doing later on. I'm just going to continue to read this here. Quote, I tried to explain there was no intent to disrespect anyone. However, we could not release this information at this time. The commissioner then said that we didn't understand that this was tied to pending gun control legislation that would make officers and the public safer. There's another person in an area of authority, just like all the COVID crap, who's using the public safety as an excuse to, uh, to go around the law. Scanlon, in an interview with The Inquiry, backed up what was in Campbell's notes and said that Trudeau and then Public Safety Minister Bill Blair were interfering, quote, weighing in on what we could and couldn't say. It wasn't the first time this had happened in, uh, the, sorry, I gotta read that again. It wasn't the first time this had happened in Scanlon's view. She pointed to Lucky, so remember Lucky again is the RCMP commissioner, giving interviews to several media outlets during the aftermath of the shooting, providing an ever increasing number of victims. This was at a time when local RCMP officers were still trying to determine the total number of victims. While local officials were saying in excess of 10 people had been killed, Lucky gave a series of interviews on the evening of April 19th with the number killed ranging from 13 to 17. Scanlon said she believed it was political pressure from Ottawa. Um, I remember a couple of years ago hearing about things like this as well, and a lot of people thinking it was a bunch of BS. Oh, that, that could never happen. Well, now you know. Um, and then people wonder why they... Uh, 
people wonder why, sorry, the government wonders why people don't trust their governments. It's because of stuff like this. I'm just going to continue reading here. Quote, that is 100% Minister Blair and the Prime Minister, and we have a commissioner that does not push back, Scanlon said in her February 2022 interview. Just three days after that, April 28th, 2020 meeting, where Campbell said that Lucky made clear she had promised certain information be released ahead of legislation being introduced, the Trudeau government acted. They announced that they were issuing an order in council, so that's the OIC, effectively banning the AR-15 rifle and 1,500 other models from use in Canada. The killer in the Nova Scotia massacre did use an AR-15, but had purchased it illegally after it was smuggled in from the United States. He was not allowed to own guns in Canada and had, uh, and had been under a previous court order ban on possessing guns. He had also been reported by neighbors to the RCMP, but they never acted until it was too late. So again, there you go uh, for all the anti-gunners out there uh, banning guns. Obviously, in this case, it didn't really work, did it? I'm going to continue. The massacre in Porta Peak was preventable if people had done their jobs properly. They didn't, and that is what the inquiry should be mainly focused on. This latest report, though, has given us a window into the lengths that Trudeau, Blair, and Lucky were willing to use the massacre for their own political agenda. It should be noted that Blair has denied any pressure was exerted, but I don't believe him and neither should you. He, along with Trudeau and Lucky, should be run out of office and forever hang their heads in shame. And this uh, article was written by uh, Brian Lilly, and that was written on uh, June 21st. Um, so... Um, we saw the same thing happen with the Uvalde, Texas shootings, right? We, uh, the, the shooting happened in Texas, and literally a week later, the Trudeau liberals uh, pushed through the handgun ban. So we know what this government is capable of. Okay, so now that we've talked about that, I did find an old clip of, uh, not really old, it's, two, it's from two years ago, um, from CTV News, uh, titled RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky Under Pressure from MPs on Systemic Racism. Uh, you guys remember all the George Floyd nonsense and how uh, you know everything is considered racist now. Everything has systemic racism. Um, and I'm going to play this video for you guys, and you have to listen to her reaction. Uh, I don't. Uh, if you remember, she had actually said that the RCMP had systemic racism in it. Um, so I'm just going to play that for you and just take a listen. RCMP is under more pressure this morning. Commissioner Brenda Lucky facing new questions over racism in Canada's national police force and the violent encounters between RCMP and Indigenous Canadians that have been making headlines. After a backlash earlier this month, Commissioner Lucky now concedes there is systemic racism in the RCMP. But she's now looking at more criticism this morning after speaking to a Commons committee last night. We begin this hour with... And just to uh, give you some background context, if you remember at the time, this was this video is from June 24th, 2020. Um, and during this time, uh, remember, everybody was on the, the Black Lives Matter bandwagon. Everybody was... Uh, wanted to protest in the streets, you know, everybody was, you remember the actors doing those, the celebrities doing those videos saying I am responsible, which made me basically want to throw up. Um, so let's keep listening here. Laura McQuillan and coverage of her testimony on that issue, notably Laura of systemic racism. That's exactly what the Public Safety Committee is looking at here, uh, launching its own look at the wider issue, and that of course comes against the backdrop of protests over the police uh, action or inaction towards racialized Canadians. Also, those violent encounters we've been reporting on in recent weeks between the RCMP and Indigenous men, uh, including several caught on camera and of course the death of Rodney Levi, shot dead by the RCMP in New Brunswick just a couple of weeks ago. Now, Brenda Lucky has in recent weeks flip-flopped on systemic racism in the RCMP when asked if it's an issue. Uh, at times she has said that she struggled to define what systemic racism is. She told the Globe and Mail she did not believe that there was systemic racism in the RCMP. Since then, she's backtracked. She said she acknowledges there is systemic racism in the force. Uh, but yesterday, when she was speaking to the Public Safety Committee, she had an exchange with Liberal MP Greg Fergus. He asked her about that, and he asked her for some examples of what it looks like. And here's the response she gave. It wasn't quite what MPs expected. Um, 
one thing I want to say about this as well is this is uh, just the date in mind. Uh, remember, uh, the liberals, they are all about the systemic racism and everything is about systemic racism. It's in all our institutions, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just very interesting that this is a couple of months after the the massacre uh, that happened in Nova Scotia and how she's flip flopped. And and now today on in 2022, we're finding out that she wanted uh, this anti-gun agenda to go through. Yes, there's absolutely systemic racism. I can give you a... So this is Brenda Lucky, the RCMP commissioner, talking now. A couple of examples. We have a physical abilities a requirement evaluation. It's an obstacle course. Um, in there, um, there's a six-foot mat and that you have to do a broad jump. And there are people in all different cultures that may not be six feet, including... Um, there's not a lot of women that are six feet tall. It's systemic discrimination. So it's systemic racism because you can't uh, clear a uh, an obstacle course. Has nothing to do with what's required for the job, and that that's what these people's idea of systemic racism is. But a lot of this stuff is starting to really come together now. I don't know if you guys can see the same thing, and if you disagree, let me know in the comments as well. Discrimination, but I'm trying to think of uh, systemic racism. Um. Uh. In our, uh, the, we have some questions, for example, in our um, aptitude test. And you know what, I might refer uh, Gail because uh, that is uh, Gail's uh, specialty. In other words, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And it seems like uh, someone has, uh, um, she's, she's hiding something. That's what it seems like anyway, allegedly. Now, the Gail that she referred to was the head of human resources for the RCMP, Gail Johnson, who then gave an answer saying the RCMP has made changes to the way it recruits uh, people from the north because there had been some issues in getting recruits who were able to travel to do the test or who had driver's licenses. So some changes there, she says, to improve things in terms of systemic racism, no current examples given. And certainly that example from Brenda Lucky of some recruits not being tall enough to do a jump adequately on an obstacle course will not stack up for critics who are expecting better answers than that when it comes to systemic racism in the RCMP, Heather. Laura, the commissioner also asked about the future of policing and specifically about the calls we're now hearing across the province to defund the police and divert some of that money in part to things like mental health supports. And I mentioned this a few times in a couple of the other episodes, the defund the police. Isn't it funny how that just suddenly went away, especially after the election uh, when uh, Trump lost? Um, uh, they were calling for defund the police every day. I remember talking to people during this time, too, and uh, I was following a lot of what was happening in the States. And they were when I was saying, well, that stuff's going to come to Canada, too. And people looked at me like I was insane, saying, well, they're, they're not going to they don't want to defund the police. And I'm just like. No, dude, this stuff always trickles down to, to Canada as well. Well, I should say trickles up since we are in the north, but you guys will know what I mean. A lot of the testimony dealt with the number of mental health calls that Mounties and members face, and it was pretty eye-opening how she described that situation. That's right. Uh, she described how there has been a spike in mental health calls that the RCMP have been going out to, some 10,000 a month, uh, which she described as an exponential increase. Now, as you mentioned with those calls to defund the police, there have been people saying that mental health professionals should be attending those wellness checks instead of police officers who may be armed and who may have a confrontation with the person at the centre of that call out. And heaven, heaven forbid a police officer is armed to... Uh... Uh, when going into a possibly dangerous situation. But Brenda Lucky defended the way the police respond to those mental health calls with this. It's so important that the first response when a person is in crisis, and I have said at three o'clock in the morning when somebody's wielding a knife and they're suffering from a mental health crisis, that is not the time to bring in mental health practitioners. It's time for the RCMP to go in get that person calm, get them to a place of safety and get them the help they need. So it's not about defunding, it's about funding everything that goes along. And I think we can work better with our mental health practitioners. Now, while critics wouldn't disagree that there could be better cooperation between police and mental health services, uh, they may disagree on her point about it being appropriate timing for the police to go in when they receive those call outs. And certainly MPs have been calling for better answers in the wake of what they heard last night, Heather. Lauren. Okay, so that ends there. Um, I just, I remember 
man, this brings back memories. I just remember watching stuff like this and um, I, I follow a lot of conservative uh, outlets on like Facebook and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I just remember, uh, you know, seeing memes about like mass murderers and, you know, sending a social worker to go and uh, and deal with it instead of the police, right? Um, just, a, just a bunch of utter nonsense. And, uh, and again, like a lot of the stuff you haven't heard and... W- a lot of us uh, tend to have short-term memories, and I, I even forgot about a lot of the stuff until this just popped up on my uh, on my YouTube uh, with the algorithm here. Um, okay, the next thing I want to talk about is the uh, Uvalde, Texas shooting. Um, so once again, we know that our government has used this as an excuse to push through um, handgun. Uh, the handgun ban, which is absolutely ridiculous because all it does is affect uh, law-abiding gun owners like ourselves and licensed gun owners. Um, But a lot of new information is coming out with regards to Uvalde, Texas. So I'm just going to play a video uh, for you. This came from uh, Fox News and uh, it gives a lot of the details about what the cops were doing at the time in Texas. And it's really going to make, I I do apologize, it's probably going to make your blood boil. But again, um, it's like those words that uh, when Ronald Reagan said, uh, you know, the nine most terrifying words are, uh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I think it's nine, right? Uh, I'm from the government and I'm here. Yeah, nine words. Um, Anyway, it's a lot of people just want to rely on the government for their protection. And uh, once you listen to this video, uh, it's pretty disturbing. So take a listen here. This is Outnumbered. Hello everyone, I'm Emily Campagno, here with my co-hosts Kaylee McEnany and Harris Faulkner. Also joining us today, Morgan Ortegas and Jimmy Fela. Mm-hmm. Now breaking new developments in the deadly Uvalde school shooting, the Texas Public Safety Director testifying just a short time ago that law enforcement had enough officers on the scene to have stopped the gunman three minutes after he entered the building, and calling the law enforcement response, quote, an abject failure. The stunning new details come as we get the- Okay, so right now they're showing a picture of um, four uh, police officers. They're in like military outfits and there's two ballistic shields in front of them with their guns pointed down the hallway. First chilling images from inside the school that day. This surveillance photo you're looking at shows cops with rifles and ballistics shields in the hallway, but they waited another hour to storm the classroom. This photo was taken at the same time, but now you see it's a different angle. And it also highlights that officers were ready to go in. Okay, and this this is actually a uh, wider angle of the hallway and you can see much, much further down. But didn't. And at the end of those 77 minutes, 19 students, including the daughter of one of the officers stationed there in the hallway and two teachers were dead or dying. Others sustained serious physical injuries. The emotional and psychological harm will be lifelong for survivors and their families. Okay, so you heard that right. One of the police officer's daughters was in that school. <clears throat> so I'm willing to bet that obviously he was wanting to go in. This has got to be like some um, a, an issue with uh, the commander or something like that because I can't see that many cops not willing to go in and do something. It was the deadliest school shooting in Texas history. Jimmy, in stark contrast to those officers that waited over 90 minutes until he was actually shot, when SWAT came, Mm -hmm. there was four minutes Mm -hmm. in between them arriving and him actually being shot dead. Yeah, I think the problem here is there's so many overlapping timelines and variations of this story, but the one common thread is that with children in the classroom, they waited to go in. And there's no parent watching this. There's certainly no parent victimized by this horrible tragedy. That's okay with them waiting to go in. And that's the big issue here. To hear law enforcement outright condemn this as a failure, it hurts me because I know it hurts them too. They didn't want this outcome. And I say this all the time. I am embarrassingly supportive of police. I would be a cop if they didn't have a thing called a background check. But the fact that they do means I'm here doing what I do. And I have a lot of empathy for everybody involved. But there's just no world where we're okay with children not being the priority. Because when you hear something like, well, we didn't know if it was an active shooter situation, so we stood down for a minute. There's no world where there's kids in a classroom with a man with a gun 
and we have like a sliding scale of tolerance. There's no tolerance. Um, and I remember when Columbine happened too, a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I've read. Um, <clears throat> Uh, their new policy was to go after an active shooter right away, uh, you know, after Columbine and Sandy Hook and all that kind of stuff. So this is this is uh, this is a huge failure on failure on the part of the cops. But like I said, I have a feeling it was this has to be like a commanding issue. They should have been in there. And it hurts me to say that. That's right. And just to be clear, so the Texas police, they entered the corridors of the school 19 minutes after the gunman entered the building. And then they entered the actual classroom 58 minutes later. And Kaylee, to Jimmy's question about the, the children in there, we have now transcripts that are quite damning, unfortunately, for that police chief. But we have on there an officer that said, uh, if there's kids in there, we need to go in there. Another responded, whoever's in charge will determine that. Um, it goes on. We'll get so whoever's in charge will determine that. Get into more of that later, but I know you have part of the timeline of the children who were calling 911 themselves from yeah, inside the room. Absolutely. And you've got to wonder who that officer was. Was it the officer whose daughter was in there? I'm sure he was saying, let's go in. You can't imagine being a parent there. But yeah, it's chilling. You know, Emily, I read this one line that stood out to me in this Texas Tribune um, kind of expose with a lot of new details. By noon, officers had rifles, a hooligan, and at least one ballistic shield, yet made no attempt to enter the classroom for 50 minutes. So that's according to the Texas Tribune by noon. Well, we have this timeline, much of which was read out to us uh, during one of those press conferences by law enforcement. The timeline says this, 12.03, first 911 call from inside the classroom from a girl, it was this one girl, there had been calls prior, who whispers that she's in the room. She makes a second call at 12.10, the same little girl saying multiple people are dead. She makes a third call at 12.13. She called again. She makes a fourth call, the same little girl at 12.16 and says eight or nine students are still alive. Imagine being this little girl. You've called one time, two time, three time, four time, and then the initial caller who made the first 911 call called at 12.36. 1243 she says please send the police now imagine being that little girl who's brave enough to pick up your phone brave enough to make the call one two three four times please please come this is a damning timeline it's catastrophic and harris of course the investigation is not over but at the same time given what we know now uh the public is demanding answers especially the families of those victims yeah we're gonna we're gonna have to wait for all of this to come out and it won't be easy the drip drip and I'm not sure if you guys heard about the um, uh, the former Border Patrol, or maybe he was a Border Patrol. I, I, I don't remember if he was still working as Border Patrol, if he used to be. Um, this guy was getting his hair cut at the time, and uh, the, his wife, who I believe was a teacher there, said there was a gunman. And, uh, you know, she said, I love you on the phone and all that. And I, the barber, <clears throat> so he was in the barber shop, and the, guy, the uh, barber had a shotgun there. So this... Uh, border patrol agent basically took the shotgun and led a bunch of guys into the school. Uh, and I, and I believe I, now correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe he was the one who shot, uh, who, who killed the actual shooter. Um, at least that's, that's what I remember. It's been, it's been a few weeks now. So, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong on that. But anyway, so he, uh, in these situations, obviously you have, to, there's no time to waste. They have to get in there. So, um, there's going to, I don't know what that, there's going to be a lot of explaining to do in this case because uh, that's just disgusting the amount of time it took them to go in there. And even if, again, if you're worried about hitting other kids and stuff like that, like, um, it's, uh, I don't know, what do you, what do you guys think of the situation? Because uh, in my opinion, it was, it would have been better to take a, take a chance, take him out. And uh, as opposed to him having a free for all, uh, let's continue with this. Um, there will be stories that coordinate crossing timeline we now know because 58 minutes is an eternity. So we know that we have video of parents being held on the perimeter, um, some of them with police acting against them, you know, reports of pepper spray and of, of, of the, the cuffing of parents um, with the plastic strips. Uh, one mom who managed to get away makes it to the school, gets her kids out. I mean, there was a lot transpiring potentially that'll overlap that timeline. But two words really stand, stood out to me from your setup to this, and it was death, dying. 
The death part we know. Were there people who could have been saved? The dying. And listening to that child and what you just recounted too. Kaylee, there's another word that stands out and that's bravery. We're the home of the brave. Where was the bravery of these men and women standing outside with uniforms? You go toward the gunshots. Here's another thing, too, because I, I, um, in one of my other videos, I actually do think uh, teachers in the U.S. should be able to conceal and carry. Um, I was watching, actually, a, a quick interview on the Joe Rogan podcast yesterday, too, and I, and I don't know who he was talking to, but this one the, whoever he was interviewing had made a good point. He said, you don't mandate it, but you give the option because it it keeps the shooter guessing and they don't know if it's going to be a, a, a hard target or a soft target if it's not a law that no one can have uh, can conceal and carry, right? And in this case, again, um, you know, a lot of people are calling for guards on the perimeter and all that kind of stuff. Um what this guy who was being interviewed by Rogan uh, made a point was he said a lot of these shootings are planned and the first person that this shooter is going to try to take out is the person on the, the person or people on the perimeter. So if you keep them guessing about who's carrying and who's not, it's pr- going to be probably a less likely target, which I think makes a lot of sense. I don't know. What do you guys think about it? Put it in the comments below. Um, but I, Again, you had a bunch of cops out there for an hour, right? And, you know, a lot of people say, well, let the police do their job. Let the police do their job. Well, obviously, in this case, they didn't do their job. And how many people, how many kids died because of this? Uh, whereas, you know, if, if some teachers did have, uh, work, did have a, a, a weapon on them, you know, what would their chances have been? Um, because you're in the school, really, you've got no, there's nowhere to run to, right? Whereas the cops were not in the line of fire. You're in the line of fire though, and you're trained to use that weapon. Um, you're probably more likely to use it to protect yourself. And I, I understand there's uh, anxiety and stress and all that stuff that comes into play as well. But uh, again, this is just a huge failure on the part of the Texas cops because uh, for like 50 minutes, that's ridiculous. Um, we, we know how long like a minute can go by in these situations. If, you ever, if you've ever seen footage of people trying to attack another person or trying to attack a, uh, a cop with like a knife or a gun, you see how fast that can end. It ends in seconds, right? Um, so really sad that this took so long. I'm just going to continue with this video. You do. And if you aren't brave, sit down and let somebody go who is. That's right. And here's... Uh, Morgan, there were officers that absolutely acted heroically. I think what we're starting to learn from the drip drip, as Harris mentioned, was sort of the the bureaucratic uh, constraints that some fell under. But however, officers who got to the scene immediately evacuated children in other classrooms when other officers failed to do so. There were officers fighting to go in the classrooms. We certainly have the transcripts and testimony um, and witness reports of such. So absolutely, including and especially the bravery of that SWAT team, the Border Patrol SWAT, that resulted in the death of that shooter so there was there was while there's immeasurable tragedy there is also immeasurable heroism um albeit perhaps a bit disproportionate from that day morgan i think that's right i i I keep the the number that keeps ringing in my ears is when you ladies were talking about at least 50 minutes um that the parents stood there Uh, i i just think about as a parent standing there for 50 minutes 58 minutes whatever the timeline ultimately ends up being and hearing the gunshots and knowing that your child is in there i i can't think of anything worse And, and while we have some really amazing local reporting going on in texas that's getting this out the drip drip that harris is referring to i also think has to be incredibly psychologically damaging for these parents because every other day you're getting confirmed the, your worst fears possible um, that the people that were supposed to protect your children didn't and so that's why I think we need to keep pushing while the local reporting is fantastic we have to keep pushing for full accountability for a full report so that this never happens again I mean what about again and I don't want to second guess you know the cops until we get that full report but you think about flash grenades or, or the riot gear that the cops have or tear gas Some Something, anything to have disabled the shooter instead of it taking almost a full hour to disable the shooter. Um, and, and so that's the accountability I'd like to see. Where is the, when are we going to get the full and comprehensive report? And it, what's interesting is, uh, again, a lot of these anti gun people are for taking away Second Amendment rights and for taking away guns from law abiding citizens in Canada. Um, 
and they just want us to be totally reliant on the government for this kind of stuff. Well, this situation just shows that in the end, we are basically uh, on our own in these situations, right? I mean, if so, now obviously the school shooting is a, a much different dynamic, but uh, you know, somebody breaks into your house, you can call 911, great, but if that person breaking into your house is armed, um, and you fail to act, you could end up being dead at the end of it just because you're worried to, to get in trouble. Um, and it's like I've said, I've said it before, like I said, from the Mark Wahlberg, uh, the cop movie, oh, I can't remember what the name of it was. But uh, again, better to be, uh, it's better to be judged by 12 than carried by six, right? So in the end, really, we're all, we're all responsible for our own safety. Um, you know, and I guess, and I guess you just deal with the consequences after that fact. Where is the line, my life for yours? That's right. I mean, I, I don't want to turn it to, you know, I'm not going to prophesize because that's not my role. The Lord hasn't called me to do that. But I am a witness by trade. And where is that person? There's always one in a disaster and hurricanes, tornadoes. I've, I've covered that person who decides my life for yours, especially for a little one. And if they were arguing about bureaucracy, that to me isn't an argument. Shoot me in the back as I can rescue people. Like, where is that person? And maybe they were there in droves and we don't know yet. Maybe that's the drip trip. I wish they'd spill that faster. That's right. Well, the one officer who showed up just really quickly because he had gotten a call from his wife, who was one of yeah. the teachers, who she said she was bleeding out. She thought he would. So this was the Border Patrol, uh, the Border SWAT guy they were talking about now turned away so he arrives in the hallway and according to the reporting i was reading the texas tribune he was turned away by others yeah absolutely heartbreaking and you know in the in the i don't know if it's the manual or the charging papers essentially for law enforcement there it specifically says if you're not prepared to give your life for others perhaps yes. this is not the right calling for you and i think unfortunately you know despite or no matter how much training there is and how much logistics and 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 factors and assets in the school districts that we have Sometimes you can't test the measure of a human until that moment. Yeah, that's the most frightening part. Hey, everyone. I okay, so we'll stop that there. Um, so again, any thoughts you guys have? It's a very difficult situation, obviously, but I think it is important to talk about it. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is we're back to Canada now. Um, read an article now. It's pretty bad when Jordan Peterson is uh, talk. If you don't know who Jordan Peterson is, he's a professor. Used to be a professor at University of Toronto. Um, I believe he's done there now. Though he write, he writes a lot of uh, great stuff. Some great books. I've got one of his books. It's called uh, Ten Rules for Life. Um, I have a second book too. I didn't find it as good, but anyway, uh, that's beside the point. Uh, even he's crit He's been very critical of the Trudeau government lately, and uh, so. Uh, the li I'll, I'll just get into the article. This is from the National Post. This is written by Ryan uh, uh, Tumil Tumilty. Uh, it says, Liberals propose another year of hybrid parliament. So if you don't know what the hybrid parliament is, you know how we have some liberals, uh, some MPs who are, in, who are directly in the House of Commons, and then you've got some who are working from, uh, from home virtually, you know, that nonsense. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, it is nonsense. At this point, if you're still afraid of this pandemic, uh, you can be a, as offended as you want. Um, maybe you should just like live in your basement because honestly, life goes on. There are risks and, uh, you know, um, I've never seen people so afraid to get sick in my life. I've actually met people now who don't even want to get a cold. They don't want to get anything now because they've been so brainwashed into thinking we're not supposed to get sick. Anyway, let me get into this article. So it says, liberals propose another year of hybrid parliament. And it says, quote, we are still in a pandemic reality, said House Leader Mark Holland, while noting the PM and other MPs have had COVID in recent days. Um, the Liberals are looking to keep Parliament by Zoom call in place for another year with a motion to extend the hybrid House of Commons to be introduced this week. Um, Liberal House Leader Mark Holland announced the government's plan Monday morning as the House of Commons enters its final week before breaking for the summer. He said the hybrid parliament where MPs can appear in person or via video conference made parliament work during the pandemic and it might be important to keep around. As an example, he said five MPs, including the prime minister, had COVID-19 in just the past week and otherwise would not have been able to participate in debates and votes. Quote, it's meant that we've had the flexibility to successfully allow members to continue to participate even when ill and making sure that they didn't infect others, he said. We are still in a pandemic reality and that we need the tools to <clears throat> and that we need the tools to ensure the members of parliament can participate fully in the proceedings of parliament. 
Holland said the government is proposing a parliamentary committee study the uh, committee study the issue over the next year and decide what worked or didn't work before establishing new rules. Quote, we think it's important that Parliament be the ones to do the work of looking at what was and what was not successful in utilizing these hybrid provisions, he said. The rules allow MPs to participate in the House either in person or via Zoom and to vote through a secure voting app. Uh, parliamentary interpreters have complained about the setup, saying it causes hearing strain, and some have filed complaints over workplace injuries. Holland pledged cabinet ministers would appear in person for question period. He said a motion will be presented to the Commons likely on Wednesday with the details of his proposal. The House is set to rise for a summer recess on Thursday. Conservative House leader John Brassard said the government is wasting time on this issue when bigger debates could be had in the final week. Quote, rather than using the time to address the cost of living crisis that Canadians are facing, the Liberals are going to set up Parliament in a way that suits them, he said. When the Liberals talk about a hybrid Parliament, what they're really talking about is a Parliament where they can be less accountable. And I don't know about you guys, but I totally agree with that because then there's all, if you keep it to a hybrid, there's always an excuse for not being there. Oh, I was able to vote, um, <clears throat> I was able to vote from uh, far away. Um, oh, we couldn't have a proper debate. The tech, debate, the technology was down. Um, is it, to me, it's just it's just a crock. And how many other people out there are are working class people, uh, trades people um, out there who have been working since this uh, pandemic started? I hate saying that word pandemic because I've heard it so often. Um, then it continues, the Liberals, with consent from other parties, set up the hybrid system during the height of the pandemic. The online voting app was added last year, allowing MPs to vote from anywhere in Canada. In addition to the, U to the issues with interpreters, Broussard said the voting app has crashed and committees have occasionally descended into chaos because of members participating virtually. Again, so that any, uh, any issue with technology is going to have issues. I have some friends who are teachers who basically work in a hybrid model and they say it's a disaster. Um, when my kids were online virtually, that was a disaster. So uh, technology has its place up to a limit, in my opinion anyway. He said there is no reason MPs can't be in the chamber. Quote, our parliament, the seat of power, constitutionally is here in Ottawa. Everyone who gets elected to parliament understands their role and responsibility, and that's to be here to stand up to make themselves counted. Broussard said with COVID cases waning and mandates being lifted, having debates about hybrid parliament makes no sense now. He said if the situation changed, the conservatives would be happy to take another look. Quote, if something happens in the fall, we can adjust, but why we're making this determination in the last week of Parliament is beyond me. Um, and then I just want to see if I could find that uh, Jordan Peterson quote. Um, I, sorry, guys, I can't find it right now. But basically, um, uh, Jordan Peterson was saying he was embarrassed to live in this type of Canada when virtually every other country has moved on. Holland also accused the Conservatives of being obstructionist. Um, in, la in this last session, he said they used delay, taxes, uh, delay tactics, uh, filibustered and otherwise impeded the work of the commons. He said he didn't expect the conservatives to vote for liberal initiatives, but they should not have stood in the way of votes taking place. Broussard said it's not his party's job to make the liberals life easy. He said the liberals shut out the other opposition parties after making a confidence and supply deal with the NDP and the conservatives were not just going to sit back and watch. Quote, I know the prime minister would have liked an audience in the opposition, but what we're doing, what we were doing was making sure that he had an opposition. Prior to the pandemic, the House of Commons had no procedures for remote participation, allowing MPs to participate only if they were in the chamber. For key votes in the past, MPs have been brought from hospital beds to the Commons. NDP MP Peter Julian said his party will support the Liberals' motion. He said MPs have missed votes because of illness, but also bad weather and cancelled flights. Uh, quote, there was no other way to have those constituents' voices heard in Parliament. There was no other way to have their vote count in Parliament, he said. Julian said his party had limited virtual appearances to, uh, to necessity in this session. But he said COVID-19 is not in the rearview mirror and there is no reason to pack up the virtual tour tools. I, you got to love how it's always the, uh, the NDP and the Liberals, too, who are hanging on to this COVID nonsense as well. Um, sorry, guys, life does go on and eventually we do need to move on. Um, but again, this is just a pure power grab from this government and we, we know how these guys act. Quote, we've taken a very pragmatic approach to it. We use a hybrid parliament when it's necessary, but for the most part, NDP MPs have been here in Ottawa. 
Monday was the first day in months that MPs could enter buildings on the Parliament precinct regardless of their vaccination status. The Liberals announced last week that the COVID-19 vaccine mandate would be suspended. Keep in mind that word suspended because clearly they're going to they're bring it back probably. For, uh, suspended for Parliament as well as for federally regulated workers such as the civil service. Sorry guys, that was such a long article. But I think it's important because again, uh, we've got three years left of this government and it just shows there were them and the NDP, that coalition is not going anywhere. And I love when I, I listen to mainstream news on the talk radio and stuff and uh, they're saying, oh, this is not, unless you listen to more uh, conservative talk radio, uh, they're like, this is not a coalition. Um, yeah, it is. If the NDP has agreed to support anything the liberals push through, it that is what it, it that, that's a coalition. I don't know what else you would call it. Um, Okay, last thing I wanted to end off. This is more of a little bit of an inspirational thing here. Uh, this is a speech from Tamara Leach, or Lich, can't remember how to pronounce it. Um, she did receive uh, a, a, an award, like I think I believe it's called the Freedom Award for, uh, from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. Um, so I'm just gonna, it's only like two minutes, but uh, just take a listen to this. Very good speech, very inspiring. You know that democracy, that system of government that Churchill said was the worst form of government, except for all the others which have been tried? We know it has its origins in Athens. But a very important question is often missing, and that is, what gave rise to Athens? What gave rise to all the philosophy, the math, the fundamental ideas some 3,000 years ago that started Western civilization? And the answer comes to us from the historical record of one battle when the Persians attempted their invasion of Greece. The queen of Persia, surprised at the success of the Greeks who were defending their homes, asked one of her military generals, and I quote, who governs these Greeks? Who commands their army? And the general, who was also surprised by how strong the Greeks were, responded, no one. People say they are no man's slaves or servants. That was the spirit of freedom that propelled the Greeks. That is the spirit that started Athens, democracy, and the fundamental basis of our civilization. That is freedom. Do you hear me? That is freedom freedom. Nothing else of importance is at stake. It is about human flourishing and humanity's survival. Anyone who diminishes this by calling it exaggeration or hyperbole will lead you to a path of extinction. The true path is hard, but it is the only way forward. You must fight for your ancestors, fight for your children, and fight for yourselves. The future is ours. The people are awakening to a force that cannot be suppressed. Glory be to freedom, glory be to Canada, and glory be to all of you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to leave it there. So that's all I have for tonight, guys. Uh, please remember to like, subscribe, and share if you got any value out of this. Uh, please remember to comment if you want to give uh, some of your opinions on some of the topics, good or bad. And um, uh, hope you guys have a great night. Canadian Range Night here, and I will talk to you soon.